Please pray with me before I offer a message this morning. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The choir has sung for us these words, one faith, one hope, one Lord. Our commandments this morning remind us that there is one God. You shall have no other gods before me, says the Lord. We're reminded that these commandments come in these stories of Exodus after a time of division, fear, hunger, thirst. We remember our stories from the last few weeks where people were frightened that they would starve. They were frightened by their thirst, and they rebelled against their leaders. They blamed Moses and Aaron. They were divided amongst themselves. And it's precisely at that time when God gives one law, one rule that will unite the people together, a law of love which teaches them how to love God and love neighbor so that they may stay together, that they may be governed by a rule that other people would see, that they would be following the same rules, one common law that would allow them to stay as one in God's love. When people saw them obeying the, this rule and the other rules also of the Hebrew scriptures, the kosher rules, all of those different uh, rules about what they should eat, they would be seen as different from the other peoples and they would stay together, they would stay united as one people following that ancient law. And at the heart of that law are the Ten Commandments and they brought people together. Just at the right time, God gave his people a law of love that would beckon them back to a love for God and to a love for one another. Yesterday, uh, nine of our church members gathered in Fellowship Hall for something that was called Readiness 360. It's a program that our church is participating in from our annual conference, the California Pacific Annual Conference of, of the Methodist Church. And Reverend Nicole Riley is leading us. She invited our church and several other churches to participate. Here is a, an image of all of these uh, wonderful people gathered from different churches, a very diverse group. Uh, we had a, folks from the Chinese church in, in Los Angeles, from two African-American congregations, our church and uh, Belmont Church. We were also involved. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful group of people. And she said that each one of us is invited to think of our unity in God's calling to our church and how God will lead us forward. She said, I want you to remember that as you begin this process of envisioning the church's future and discerning God's will, that this is God's church. It's not the pastor's church. It's not any one church leader's church. This is God's church, and whatever we're called to do will be God's will. And in that we will be united. We will have one vision. In fact, she said, in Readiness 360, we're only going to focus on being ready for God to plant whatever that seed is that should be planted. In other words, readiness is about readying the soil, readying our own hearts with prayer, with honest communication with each other, removing the stones and thistles and weeds that might get in the way, any... Um, any bad communication patterns we have in the church, any tensions like that, we want to resolve those. We want to be reconciled to each other. We should be united in love as we listen for God's will for God's church. Amen? And then we trust the planting and the fruitfulness to God, that God will prosper the work of our hands. I encourage us all to keep this process in our prayers I think all who attended from our church yesterday were very encouraged. It was a six-hour meeting. This is a, an investment of time that our volunteers are um, involved in, in giving each, each uh, time we meet over the next year. And we're excited to see what God will do. But this is where the Ten Commandments also begin. They are a reminder that we are God's people and called to be united in one Lord. It's helpful for us from time to time to go over these commandments and remember what's in them and remember what they really mean. 
Uh, last Wednesday at our Bible study, Margaret Hewler shared with us a brief poem uh, that, that I'd like to share with you now. It ticks through the Ten Commandments very quickly and poetically. It's a poem by Elton Trueblood, and you can count the ten as, as we go. Um, Above all else, love God alone. Bow down to neither wood nor stone. God's name refuse to take in vain. The Sabbath rest with care maintain. Respect your parents all your days. Hold sacred human life always. Be loyal to your chosen mate. Steal nothing, neither small nor great. Report truth. We report with truth your neighbor's deed and rid your mind of selfish greed. You shall not covet is what that means, of course. Pretty clever, isn't it? Uh, that brief poem. It would be good for us to memorize uh, in, one, in one go those Ten Commandments. And it's good for us to internalize what they mean, that they are a call back to God's law of love, which makes us one as God's people. We might remember also to frame these Ten Commandments in the, the teachings of Jesus. He was once asked, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law Jesus taught us. And we see that in these Ten Commandments, it's true, they teach us first a love for God and then a love for each other. It's very simple. It's just a little more detailed than Jesus gives us. First, we're called to love God and then to love one another. The first four commandments are about our relationship with God. The second six are about our relationship with others. Uh, when we also look at these commandments, we say, see that they belong, they begin close to the heart. Uh, love God above all other gods. We examine our motivations. Where is our heart? And then in concentric circles, we move out to our family and then to other people. That's the direction and the flow of these Ten Commandments. So as we read each one and remember what they say, uh, we begin with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. We're asked to examine our hearts. What governs our decisions? What determines our behavior? Is it God's love? Or is it some self-centered motivation or interest? Have no other gods before me. This, of course, means in our words and actions, we put God's, uh, our allegiance to God above all else. In our gospel reading from Matthew today, we were reminded to do this both in our words and in our actions. Jesus reminded his people that even the tax collectors and the prostitutes who reveal the love of God through their actions are more faithful than the scribes and the Pharisees who simply spoke about their religion. He reminded us to put our faith into real action. As we love God, we should show it in our lives. The second commandment is similar. You shall not make for yourself an idol. We ask ourselves, is there some object of our desire that begins to possess us? Is there a possession that possesses our thoughts or our minds? Some obsession that captivates our loyalties? Does this false idol come before God? Both of these first two commandments uh, cause us to examine our allegiance. The third commandment reads, You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. This is often interpreted as a prohibition against using God's name frivolously, which, of course, it also means uh, we're not supposed to use those words that we text saying OMG uh, on our uh, text messages. Um, using God's name meaninglessly or frivolously is, is uh, against this commandment. But this commandment also has a deeper meaning. We are not to do anything in God's name that is a violation of God's nature. We're not to commit some act that is inconsistent with the character of God. When a messenger was sent in the name of a king, for example, he was supposed to embody that king's character and give the king's message. 
So if we take the name Christian and we act in the name of Jesus Christ and do things that are against the nature of Jesus, we take his name in vain. One example of this might be the Christian Crusades. In fact, it surely is an example of this. The Christian Crusades were an act of violence and an act of aggressive war waged by Christians in Jesus' name against Muslims and against Jews. Many Muslims and Jews were killed in those medieval times as Christians marched to recapture the Holy Land from those neighbors. They invoked Christ's name as they broke God's commandments, as they killed their neighbors. They did so in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the ultimate way of taking God's name in vain, isn't it? Or today, as we see acts of terror committed in the name of Allah, here too, someone is taking the name of God in vain, even as they break God's own law. These are clear ways of taking God's name in vain and violating the nature of God. One way to say this is that we are never to attribute to God anything but God's true attributes. The fourth commandment calls us to remember the Sabbath, and it invites us to a wonderful practice to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, to stop once a week and to appreciate all that God has done, just as God stopped on the seventh day and appreciated his own handiwork. I remember as I was uh, traveling with our Sierra Service Project group, our young people going to do our mission trip this past summer, we worshiped one morning at a church in Oregon, and the pastor was preaching about Sabbath, which was perfect for me because I got to sit in the pews and just enjoy and rest and not work as I heard him preaching about Sabbath. And as he preached, the message became very clear that the Sabbath is a time to enjoy God's creation, to enjoy all that God has made. God has worked very hard to create this marvelous universe. Shouldn't we stop and enjoy it? Shouldn't we enjoy the work of our hands and rest and be blessed for a day? Isn't that the very best part of life, to enjoy the show? To not do this would be like rehearsing many, many days to put on a play, but never to show the play in front of other people to let them enjoy it. It would be like a chef who cooks tirelessly in the kitchen who will not stop to simply enjoy that meal with her guests. She just goes on and cooks the next meal. Surely we should stop. We should enjoy the best part of what has been created to fully soak in and appreciate the marvelous creation of God and the work of our own hands in this world. Let us not miss the best part of life. Let us enjoy it while we still have days to do so. Amen? The rest of the commandments now turn our relationship away from our closeness to God to our closeness to others. And the fifth commandment begins with our relationship with our parents. Honor your mother and father. This command is not so much uh, about obeying mom and dad when we're kids. It's more about caring for mom and dad when they are older. In their old age, we are supposed to do our duty and turn around and take care of them as they have cared for us. The commandment says, so that your days may be long in the land that God is giving you. If you take care of your elders, hopefully one day someone will take care of you as well. It's supposed to be a cycle. This was their way of Social Security and Medicare, Medicare and all that other good stuff in those times. It was our way of taking care of our elders when they could not anymore work, but when their presence could still be enjoyed and treasured. This past week, a ministerial colleague of mine shared with me about her recent leave that she has taken. She took four years to go back to Iowa and to live with her mother and father until they died. First her mom passed away, and then her father passed away just recently. And this very wise preacher named Jane, I hope to have her come 
share with us some, some time. Um, she, she shared with me that this was a therapeutic time. It was a healing time because there were things in her childhood that she still had questions about. There were things that she still wrestled with from her upbringing. And she found that this time of quiet presence with her mother and father were healing, were therapeutic, were tremendous gifts to her that she would carry throughout her life because she found peace with her mom and dad. Stuff that years of therapy might never address were probably addressed during those times of quiet interactions. Perhaps they didn't even talk it out. Perhaps Jane just realized, I can let this go now. That's just the way that she is. I can let this go. That's just the way he's, he's always been. And there's probably good reasons for that. She was able to let go and to heal in ways that will bless her for the rest of her life. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't that a wonderful byproduct of honoring her mother and father? These commands are sublime. They restore our relationships. They bring forgiveness. And they teach us God's law of love. Commandments 7 through 9 are rather straightforward. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which means don't lie. It, it literally meant don't go to the court and swear that uh, something is true about your neighbor that is not true, that could destroy their life and bring uh, a bad reputation or punishment upon them. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I skip one? I sure did. <laughs> I skipped a big one. <laughs> um, the sixth commandment uh, is you shall not murder. Um, this, is, this is a big one. Um, six through nine are, of course, all ways that we can uh, violate one another's life, violate one another's autonomy that we can trespass against each other in a terrible way that destroys community. Uh, you shall not murder is probably the best translation. You shall not kill um, is another translation, but the, the sense of this commandment is, is probably murder. This past Monday, our hearts were surely broken as we woke up to the horrible news that 58 people were murdered in Las Vegas, Nevada. We see the power of our sinful and evil acts when we decide senselessly to take someone's life. It, it destroys community. It sends us scattering and running. It sows distrust and fear within our hearts. We see what a powerful act of disunity that becomes. You shall not murder, says the Lord. And let us all pray that our leaders going forth will do everything in their power to prevent these things from ever happening again. These commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, preserve the unity of our community. They keep us from chipping away at human trust and human relationships. And finally, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet, teaches us, much like the first two commandments, not to put any possession before our love for God and one another. Sometimes we can become obsessed with an, er an earthly possession. We're taught by this commandment to be grateful for what we already have, not to put our energies into wanting what we do not yet possess. We have to be especially careful with this commandment because we hear on commercials every day that we should want what we don't have. Uh, this in some ways drives our behavior and drives our economy, but we have, to let, we have to be in control of that impulse and not let it control us. Do not covet what belongs to someone else. I, I love the Clash song. The Clash are one of my favorite punk bands, and in that song, uh, the lead singer sings, I went to the market to realize that what I need, I just don't have. I love that line because we often learn that we need what we don't have as soon as we get to the store, don't we? Or Cheryl Crow's song 
where she sings Soak Up the Sun, and she says, I don't have digital, I don't have diddly squat. It's not having what you want, it's wanting what you've got. And then she goes on to sing, I'm going to soak up the sun and appreciate what I have, what God's already given me. What if we didn't spend our lives trying to have what we want, but wanting what we've got, as she sings, being thankful for what we have already been given. Gratitude is the best antidote to coveting. If we're tempted to want what everybody else wants or to keep up with the Joneses, we have forgotten to be grateful for what we have already got. Let us practice that thanksgiving. Amen. Jesus taught us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments hang all of God's law. May we do these things in word and in action so that our lives and our world may be shaped by the life-saving love of God so that all may people, people may know the goodness of the Lord. May it be so. Let us pray. God of truth and wisdom, we cherish your teachings. Your laws bring us back together and restore our relationship with you. We thank you that you teach reconciliation in our relationships and peace in our world. We thank you for your law, which teaches us to live in harmony with all of our neighbors. And we ask that you would help us, Holy Spirit, to aspire to this love and grace that we have known and seen in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So cure our inclination toward division. Keep us from violence. Forgive the sins of our world. Heal, O oh Lord, the brokenhearted neighbors who continue to mourn, mourn their loved ones who were killed and all those who were injured in Las Vegas last week. O oh God, if there is any way for us to prevent such senseless violence in the future, give us the wisdom and the will to do so. Sow seeds of peace in all of our relationships from those who are nearest to our hearts, our beloved family members, our parents, to our neighbors throughout the world. May peace truly begin with us in our actions and words spoken in your name. Keep us true to your law and to the way of Jesus' love so that we may live as one, forgiven and loved eternally by your Holy Spirit, for we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.